There we go. And I am really glad to welcome everybody to this month's Career Conversations Book Club. And we're do- joined today by Sharon uh, Drodge Davis, uh, Sharon D. Davis, or Sharon Drodge. And she'll let us know which name she's going to prefer us to, to reference her as, as we talk about her book, Idea, A Personal Roadmap to Authenticity. And I'm really excited to, uh, to have this conversation uh, with Sharon. We'll introduce her a little bit uh, in a little bit. But I wanted to start off just with a few welcoming housekeeping uh, matters. So as a reminder, the reason that this Career Conversations book club has even started is to um, really marry uh, the love that I had for three things, books, reading, uh, books and reading together, powerful career conversations and bringing people together in a community. And uh, a couple of years back when I had a stack of books that I hadn't gone through, I thought I want to go through these books, but I also want to have conversations about them. And the first one that I wanted to go through, um, I connected with the author. She said she'd be online to to speak with us about it. And it just went from there. And now we're into a year and a half of authors and books to have conversations with. If you'd like, feel free to post your thoughts on social media with the hashtag GA Career Conversations. Um, we're going to hear from tonight's guest in a, in a short while, who I'm thrilled to have join us. But just as a reminder for the format, uh, for those of you who might be new to the Career Conversations, really we are doing the first 30 minutes roughly about Sharon and her career. The next 30 minutes will be on some questions that she and I have sort of had the chance to review in advance about the book itself. And then the last 30 minutes or so will be opening up to you for comments or questions as we move forward. And And so that time will be your chance to really give us any input or questions that you might have about what resonated for you, what questions you might have as we move forward. Um, You can still put things into the chat throughout. And so if you do have any questions or comments, feel free to add the chat. Uh, and the chat function is in the black bar that is uh, in on your computer. I'm not sure if it's the top or the bottom of your computer. We are recording this session. I hope it's already uh, started. I think that uh, has started. And for Ontario lawyers, please to note that tonight's session is eligible for one hour and 30 minutes of professionalism credit through the Law Society of Ontario. And finally, I just wanted to reiterate that my my overall goal for these conversations is to inform people, to learn together, to have open conversations, brave and powerful conversations. And I used to talk about brave spaces uh, and until I read an article by an author, Elisa Hankora, who reminded me that brave spaces can be exhausting. And since that time, I've really transferred my language and transitioned my language to suggesting an accountable space where we're responsible for our own actions, for our own words, for our own intentions. And it means really coming together um, and entering a space with good intentions, but understanding that aligning your intent with action is really the true test of commitment. I've sent around by email in the past, and if you don't have them, please let me know the accountable space guidelines that uh, that I like us to think about as we're as we're moving forward. So idea, little I, big I, whichever way you want to uh, describe idea, <laughs> starting with Sharon. Sharon, welcome. Uh, I'm going to uh, stop sharing this document and just be able to, to see you and others. So many people I uh, speak with often tell me that what they really value um, as they're contemplating their own career journey is hearing how others have gotten to where they are, what's taken them there, what's gotten them there, what challenges they've had, how they what the career journey that they've experienced has been. And so you've got a really amazing story, Um, lawyer, author, among other things. I wonder if you can share with us briefly some of your own personal highlights of your career journey. How did you start each of those different elements? And uh, how did you know when it was time to move on, if you did move on? Well, isn't that the key to life, (laughs) knowing when to move on, when it's time to move on? First of all, I have to say I'm thrilled that this was accredited for professionalism credits um, at the LSO. That makes me feel really good Um, because ultimately, um, you know, as you and I were discussing, Gina, just just before we came on here, um, lawyers are people too. (laughs) So everything that we do and we come to our careers and our choices in our careers as a person with 
with a lot of different experiences and feelings. And um, I think that it's super important for us to look at those and to look at it in the context, not just of a particular career, but as a whole person. So I think ultimately, I didn't learn to do that early on. So <laughs> back to how I got where I am and what I did. I mean, I... I articled a hundred years ago at a um, at a law firm downtown Toronto. It's probably a mid-sized firm, maybe 60 lawyers, 150 staff. You know, like at the time, it was mid-sized. And I came out um, of of articles and was called to the bar in 1991. And that was a time when there weren't a, uh, there were plentiful positions before then, but then it was a, a recession was really just hitting. Mm -hmm. And so from the background of understanding that like articling positions were plentiful, lawyer positions were relatively plentiful, and then that stopped. In fact, the firm that I articled with actually went under in the next um, little while afterwards. So clearly there was a big change in the environment. And I had a couple of offers from sole practitioners. And I felt even back then that the fit is really super important um, for anyone to work in any environment. I think first and foremost, you have to feel that's an environment that you, if you, if you don't feel it at first that you completely belong in it, you have to feel that it's something that resonates with you. You know, being around the right people is very important. And so the two positions that I was offered were both litigation positions in small firms. Um, one was a sole practitioner, he had one, one junior, and the other was two partners didn't feel right to me, either position. And I ended up taking a stopgap, what I thought was a stopgap position mm -hmm. at a legal publisher. And I ended up at Quick Law at the time, as it was. Um, it later turned into LexisNexis. And I, in fact, my stopgap position, I ended up staying there for about um, 15 years. <laughs> quite a, a stop, pretty quite long stopgap. So, <laughs> um, but you know, I I was uh, at the end in, in LexisNexis, I was, uh, I managed like 13 lawyers who created all of the, the case law content um, for the Quick Law product at the time. And I stayed there so long for a number of reasons, which I will tell you not to do. <laughs> and that would be because I had a young family, I had young children. Um, you know, it was scary to leave what I knew with something that was a, a like a solid, you know, salary and position, and then leave that to go explore what I what might make my heart's desire, you know, sing. <laughs> so I didn't do that, and I was miserable. And I spent a lot of years being very miserable. And it became clear to me that I was not going to be happy unless I was at least out there trying to help people. Even back then, before I knew about my one thing and all the other things that I put in my book, um, I understood that I wasn't, um, I wasn't happy because I wasn't doing what deep down inside I knew I needed to do. I used to say that being a lawyer is not what I do. It's who I am. And I realized afterwards, that's not quite true. I had that a little bit backwards. I think um, it's who I am that is the reason that I am a lawyer. Um, and I'll get into a little bit of, of why that is later in, in you know, doing some self-reflection and figuring out who I am. There's many ways for me to use my one thing. And I'll explain what that is after. Um, but lawyering is certainly a big one, right? So um, that totally was something missing in my life and it actually made me miserable. So I started looking around for other positions. I ended up, um, I had to sort of segue from whatever I was doing because everyone tells you if you're working in a you know, in a, in a law firm, and then you don't work in a law firm anymore. And especially 15 years of legal publishing, pretty much I would have been told by every other person out there that you're never going to get a job as a lawyer, mm -hmm. um, which totally was not the case. And I hope nobody on this call ever feels that because you can do what you want, when you want, whenever you want. Um, and that's just a given. But in any event, um, you know, I ended up working at a small boutique, uh, state litigation boutique. And I started out um, managing their knowledge management system because I had that background. I did the interview and um, uh, they were looking for someone five hours a week to do their knowledge management. And uh, after my interview, I got a job offer for five days a week. 
So I started working there. I did that. And then within a very short period of time, I was on a large trial um, with a, uh, a partner who I really liked a lot and got along with well. And I, I understood his thought process. He, he understood mine and, and it was fabulous. And I did that for um, a few years. And then I ended up, they had an office in Oakville. I live in Oakville. I've lived in Oakville for like 24 years now. And um, it was really nice to be able to like not have to go to the GO train, you know, to be able to, um, you know, get up in the morning and drive five minutes and get to work. And that's all part of work-life balance too. And so I was looking around to see what I could do um, where I live. And of course, again, as lawyers, we're all told you got to be on Bay Street or you got to be practicing, you know, um, 18 hours a day and seven days a week and all the rest of it. But I, I met um, a sole practitioner here in Oakville. His name is Rick Day, and I'm still in his space. I share space with him. I have my own soul practice now, but I do share space with him. And he said, why don't you come take over my practice? I met him at a Halton County Law Association event. And I said, well, I can't do that. I, I've just been doing estate litigation. And he did the trifecta of um, corporate law, real estate law, and he drafted some wills. And he said, sure, you can. So I said, OK, I'll give it a try. And I quickly realized that I did not like real estate law and I did not like corporate law and I loved estate law. It's always always been, uh, you know, something that resonated with me, even back in bar ads at the time where they used to teach you. Practitioners would teach you the areas of law. I loved estate law. So I concentrated on estate law and um, Rick, because he was older, wanted to have um, a transition for his for his practice and I didn't want to do the real estate in the corporate so we brought in a partner and that partner lasted about three years um I will never have another partner <laughs> we'll never do that ever again um but that also was a learning experience and in fact I think the breakup of I'll say breakup of the firm Rick and I are still here right the other partner left went on his way my life sort of continued much along the same lines but I'll tell you having a partner leave is almost like being fired so it felt a lot like a rejection and so I'm looking at this and I'm thinking okay um this didn't work out um, we had a partner leave. Um, what do I want? Right. Because as lawyers were told, oh, you want to have your own firm. You want to build that firm. You want to have a bunch of other lawyers working for you. Like that's the dream. And then later on, you have to want to be a judge, which I also don't want to be. So um, not fit in the mold here so far. And ultimately, because I was looking at what do I want next? OK, I've tried a firm. Didn't like that. So now what do I do? What do I want to do? Like as a lawyer, what are the components of my work? What do I like? What do I not like? And so I hired a business coach and he was super expensive. So I had to listen to his advice. <laughs> he said to me, he said, your time, what's your time worth? What do you charge your clients? And I told him and he said, well, I'm going to charge you the same. And I'm going, uh oh, because I couldn't afford me if I, <laughs> if I had to hire me. So that was eye opening. That was the first thing he was teaching me to value my time and to value what I did. So anyway, as we as we go along with it, he, he gives me this book and it's um, big magic. Um, and, I, you know, the same author who wrote Eat, Love, Pray, Elizabeth Gilbert. I don't know if you're familiar with her. Everyone's seen the movie. <laughs> but ultimately, um, that book, Big Magic, is all about creativity and sort of finding, you know, your, your space and your place and, and what's right for you. And as I was looking at all these things, like, what do I want to do? What do I not want to do? I'm racking my brain trying to figure it out. I put the book down and my business coach actually said, because he knew I had like the attention span was like this big because I have to read so much in, in my profession. They, he knew I wasn't going to read the whole book. So he said, read this chapter. If you read nothing else, just read this chapter. And I read the chapter. And I, I actually, I read the whole book, like I couldn't put it down. I read the whole book beginning to end, which is very un, unlike me, just being honest. <laughs> I know you read your books cover to cover and thank you for reading mine. But um, ultimately, um, you know, I'm more of a hunt and pack, let's pick whatever. Um, but I read the whole book and when I put it down, 
And this is described in the book in the beginning um, and in the Genesis chapter where I actually felt physically compelled to write a book of my own. I, I knew I had to write something. I didn't know what it was going to be. It actually formed as a, it felt like a physical thing. I described it as an orb, but I had this physical presence of something kind of in the room with me that I needed to do. And I immediately got paper and started to write things and it flowed from there. So the first chapters of the book um, came out by, by how do I think about what I want to do as a, in my career? Right. So um, the first imagery that um, you commented on, thank you, in, in, in a LinkedIn post and an Instagram post is the, the imagery of the stream. Mm -hmm. So the stream, as it occurred to me, is something that flows in a direction. It always flows to the sea. It does what it does. It supports the flora, the fauna, the fish, the, everything around it. And it never questions what direction it should flow in. It just does it and it sustains everything around it. And I thought, okay, so we all have a sense of oneness, really. Like, what is it that we're all each meant to do? And I was looking at, okay, so I'm a litigator. Do I like litigation? Yes. Do I like litigation? No. Um, and I had to try to figure out, like, okay, so what do I like about litigation? What do I not like about litigation? What am I good at? What am I not good at? And this is the part where, you know, in the beginning of the book, that's what the first chapters are, really. It's all about trying to figure those things out about yourself. So as I was doing that, I realized that my one thing, and I, that oneness, that sense of stream doing what it does best, how it comes to the world, right? And how you come to the world, whether it be uh, with personal relationships or professional relationships, it's not different. It's who you are on the inside, right? So what do you do? And for me, it was making people feel better. It helping them get unstuck, helping them. I used to say taking their burden from them for a little while, but I quickly realized as an empath, I shouldn't do that <laughs> because if I'm carrying everyone else's burden, it's going to be really difficult on me. And I learned ways over the years to help people carry their own burden and to be less fussed about it. You can leave it in my office for like, you know, a little bit if you want, but you're going to have to pick your burden up and go with it later on. But that was my one thing. Like I, I'm not happy unless I am communicating with people, trying to find out what they need, trying to help them find what they need to get, get them to the next step. And really for a state law, a legal problem or a litigation issue is just a manifestation of a deeper, bigger personal problem, right? So it's just a whole new venue for them, for sibling rivalry or or for, you know, fighting that's been going on forever or you've always hated your, you know, your stepmother or what have you. It's just another venue. And how do you get people past those feelings in order to get to the next, you know, step where you can kind of put it aside. So um, that's kind of how the book is. I was trying to figure myself out what I wanted to do. From there, I realized from doing some of the exercises in the book that I'm, I, I want to solve the problems. And I think I'm good at connecting with people and helping them solve the problems. At least I hope I am. And I'm trying to get better at that every day. Um, but uh, ultimately, I don't like fighting them out. Like when I when I get um, a file where like I've I've stopped wanting to take applicant work so that was one of the things i want do i i love i love i actually love litigation i love a problem i love the drama i have i love the drama <laughs> i couldn't do without it because the drama is awesome <laughs> but i don't want to just knock them down drag them out fight be you know face uncivil um lawyers and deal with all that nasty one-upmanship and all the rest of it i'm not about any of that and so that to me, I needed, I knew I needed to maybe fashion my career to do more of the solving the problem instead of perpetuating the problem or being a part of the problem. I even go so far as to say some lawyers. Oh yeah. Just are a part of the problem. Right. Um, so that's the, that's the issue. But ultimately, you know, if I, I, I did my LLM and dispute resolution, I found that fascinating. Um, you know, connecting with different people with different ways to solve a problem. Um, there's, there's no problem out there to which there's no solution. 
And people don't see that all the time. I don't even always see it all the time, but um, I don't know how many people on here are litigators or solicitors or whatever, but whatever your work, you know that when you get something, you don't see the, you don't see the answer right away. But after a while, the dust settles, right? And then suddenly you, you can see a little bit more clearly when the dust settles. But some of the dust is our own dust. <laughs> and so I think that is part of the issue. So, you know, as people, we all come to the table with our own kinds of experiences or hangups or insecurities you know i think really insecurity is probably one of the single biggest drivers of conflict if you think about it right so i i have i have a highlight here on my notes i'm going to say it now so i don't i don't forget to say it but you know we can change a lot about how we feel about the world around us if we do not let the world around us tell us how to feel about ourselves. So I think that is kind of in a nutshell what drives conflict if we feel disrespected. And when I say we, it could be an individual, it could be a culture, it could be, you know, conflict in general, I think is driven by perceived slights or perceived lack of respect or, um, you know, uh, perceived or not even perceived insecurity and you know the 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 most type a among us you know i i actually and we'll get to this maybe a little bit later gina it's probably it's in the questions and i know you know talking about um things like you know mental health in the profession and, and things like that it is um it, it's how we perceive ourselves that is the the most important thing and how do we shift that a little if I, my book if i can give people a different way to look at themselves in the context of the world around them instead of being controlled by it i think that that is my goal with this book because we can do an awful lot if you truly look at what your real strengths are and work on those instead of trying to make yourself better at something you're marginally good at or will never be good at. I love that. And, you know, it, it, you talked about finding that along the way in various ways. And one of the things that I was, I'm always delighted when an author has the word serendipity in their book, because it's one of my favorite words of all time for various reasons. And, you know, there was some planning, most people who go to law school and then get a job, have a very structured and organized uh, plan of what they're going to do, how they're going to do it, when they're going to do it. But serendipity plays a role as well. And you talk a lot about it. Uh, I think there's at least, you know, pages 35 and 36, and then towards the end of the book at page 203, um, but tell me how, tell us how serendipity or chance occurrences impacted your career journey. So I think serendipity, it's a common, serendipity um, is really opening your eyes to the opportunities around you. I, I think serendipity surrounds us. So the question is, are you alive to it right so you know you have to do some planning that's absolutely right I mean you know I, I plan to be a lawyer from grade nine so I just went with it and I didn't plan to work in legal publishing for 15 years or to be a sole practitioner and write a book like I, I didn't plan any of those things but I, I certainly planned to be a lawyer so you have to have a direction and I use a lot of imagery with respect to um, travel because I love travel travel is like one of them is the most fun thing for me i will spend as many hours researching travel as i would a fact him <laughs> just <laughs> saying <laughs> so that's a lot um but ultimately you know you kind of have to have a sense of where you're going right you need to know if you're going to go on a beach vacation where you're going to have my ties delivered to your chair or whether you're going to like climb kilimanjaro like you, you got you have to know basically what direction you're going in but if you're traveling in any direction and all of a sudden you realize you look at the gps and you're going in the wrong direction or you hit you hear those stories where people like drive right into lakes or something like you, you got to stop before you get to the lake right <laughs> Um, and when, when you do, you go, okay, well now I have to, you don't keep going in the wrong direction. <laughs> Nobody does that. Like you shouldn't do that. Maybe people do it. Um, you need to turn around and come up with something different. And I think really when we, we adhere too strictly 
to what our plan is, you miss an awful lot about the opportunities that are being presented to you. Because ultimately, you know, this is what networking is all about. I mean, it sounds like a really hardcore business concept, but ultimately it's about the serendipity, right? It's about, you know, putting, you have to do some work. You have to put yourself in places where serendipity can happen. I mean, if you're going to like sit at home and hide behind your couch, it's not going to knock on your door and come find you. I mean, it might, I mean, it's possible, but for the most part, you need to get yourself out there and have a direction. But lawyers are too strict. I think, I think we go, Oh no, it's gotta be this way because we're trained and told this is what you do as a lawyer. This is, this is your, your path. This is how it has to go. And if you just even stop for a second and question that, I mean, we're trained to question everything the other side tells us about a case. Why are we not trained to question what other people tell us that we should do? Like if another lawyer said, you should do this. That's what's best for your client. And they're on the other side. You're going to go, whoa, wait a minute. <laughs> I'm going to look at that and say, is that best? Is it not best? I'm going to, you know, I'm going to be critical about it. But if someone tells us that's what we should do, and it's someone who is in a position of authority or whatever, you go, oh, okay, yeah, I'll just do that. Um, I heard someone call it the other day, sheeple. It's all the sheeple who just do whatever, you know, they're told to do. And I think, I think, I think we can be smarter than that. I think we've been trained like that and I think that ultimately we can um, we can use our skills to help ourselves as well as to help other people and we frequently don't do that I think what we do is you know do knock ourselves out for others but the advice that we give to others we would never take ourselves yeah. Yeah. right no that's so true that is so true and uh, you know it's funny because you, you use the stream analogy and, and I love the, the the imagery that you're providing right now you had said uh, earlier that part of what you want people to get away from get out get from the book is to look at themselves differently and i wonder is if that's your why one of the questions that i always ask our authors is why did you you know it takes a lot to write a book um, sometimes it flows really easily but to actually go through the whole process of writing can be quite quite a long period of time and quite a lot of energy and time what was this book, what was so important for you to do to write this book, Sharon? Well, I mean, again, I think as I was, and I'll, you know, I'll say up like everybody else, I was struggling with what I was to do. Like I was, I was not happy doing what I was doing. I knew I, I liked being a lawyer, loved being a lawyer, but I didn't know why it was making me unhappy at that point in time, um, I had to examine my myself. And as I'm thinking of these things, and you know, you said, Gina, as you read the book, you, you clearly, there's a lot of me in the book. I mean, it's how books are written. It's, you know, it's your own, your own experience or your own thoughts. Some of these thoughts may have been um, triggered by clients or friends or other people's problems or um, considering, you know, other people, but a lot of it is, is me. Um, and as I'm thinking about what these things were that I needed to deal with and what was holding me back, you know, like the section on roadblocks, all the things that kind of stop you in your tracks, right? Like fear and anxiety and how do you deal with those things? And so if I had a thought on it, I would write it down. I might be on a walk with my dog, I mean, one of the passages I I was, you know, walking with my dog and something occurred to me, but I usually have my phone with me. I'd either put it in my notes or a lot of it was just good old fashioned pen to paper. And once has anyone ever heard of automatic writing? Nope. So automatic writing is if you does anyone meditate? Because if you meditate, um, Okay. Not religiously. <laughs> <laughs> well, meditate. Med meditation is a difficult thing to do, first of all, because our minds are going so quickly. It's really hard to clear them, really hard. And so it you, it takes a lot of practice to meditate. But like as as you're so automatic writing, I think is is a method of meditating. It's a method of some may even just call it journaling where you sit down at a certain time and then whatever comes out of your pen comes out of your pen. And um, they weren't, it didn't always feel like they were only my thoughts, which sounds a little woo woo. I know, but sometimes when I read my book, cause my writing's like this, 
I get all these thoughts and I write them all down and I wordsmith them and I get them the way I want them. And then I actually take my book or I did, I haven't done it in the last probably couple of months, but for, I'd say a couple of years, this has been written for a couple of years. I take my book and I flip through it every morning and I pick a page to guide me for the day. Okay, hang on. We're going to get to that. I want to ask you about that. But when I got there to the page, I go, I don't remember writing that. <laughs> so it's just one of those things that the writing sort of comes out. The thought is in a burst of creativity in a moment and you write it down. Try it. Try it like in the morning when you don't have a whole bunch of other thoughts in your head. Try it. At, maybe it's the end of the day when you're more relaxed, where you just sit with a pen to paper. Now, I mean, it can be typing too. Like it's up to you. For me, there was something about pen and paper, but then I quickly got irritated with having to transcribe from the, <laughs> from the paper to the uh, computer. And so really how the book formed was other than the first section where the whole structure, the skeleton of the book came to me and I wrote it down. Then it was all about how do I apply that and what are the things that are preventing me from doing it and how, and they would be random, I'll say random thoughts that were written down. The random thoughts then, I needed to get an editor to make sense of my random thoughts because really it's like giving your journal to somebody and having them try to fashion it into a book with like, you know, a theme or with grouping things together, because there are a lot of, of recurring themes. And even still in my new book, there's still a lot of recurring stuff. Right. So um, because because it's classic and my book. The same stuff's in a bunch of other books, too. I just say it differently than other people do. Like, these are all human thoughts, right? Like, we all have these thoughts. It's not like no one's ever, never, ever experienced any fear or no one's ever had any anxiety or, you know, like, clearly, these are human um, reactions. And so my editor read through it and then started doing a loose grouping of things for me. And that's why the book is um is in very short small chapters because they were complete thoughts and so it's easier to read you could pick it up read a couple pages or a chapter and put it down without feeling disjointed because you can pick up the book anywhere and read it and okay. then come back. So let's get to that let's get to that I'm curious who labeled the chapters you or your editor I did okay so you got the themes and uh the the chapter titles You've talked about this a couple of times, and I'm going to mess up the word. I know we when we talked, I messed it up. You talk about wanting to have people view the book or use the book as an instrument of stickomancy. Stickomancy, correct me. Stickomancy. You know, stick it's funny because I after you and I were talking about this, I I looked on the internet and one um, that was verbal uh, called it stickomancy or something. And then when you look at Webster's, it's stickomancy is the the um, the way they say it. I think it's stickomancy. It's like bibliomancy. So, so stickos to me means uh, means uh, verse. And what you've said is if you have a question or issue you are pondering, randomly flip the book open to a page, you will find some guidance that may offer a solution or help you get unstuck. Now, what do you mean by this, if you can let us know, because you've already said that that's what you do in some mornings in any event, but what do you mean by this, and how did you go about writing the book in this fashion? So people, and, and I tried that, I usually have sticky notes all over, but I wanted to do it a little bit different, so I did read it in order, but then I also tried doing what you suggested, randomly going to an area, hmm, what does this mean to me? So tell us a little bit about that port that type of uh, writing that you did. I think it's because the thoughts were complete insular thoughts and that the, the book is, is written that way that it's probably lends itself to stigmancy. So, um, I mean, often sometimes I'll say, OK, give me some guidance for the day or I'm pondering this issue. Is there something I should be thinking about with respect to that? And then when you flip open the book. I find nine times out of 10, I know, I know exactly how it relates to my problem. I can figure it out. Um, in fact, when I did my LLM, I only had one class, unfortunately for me, that was in person. Mm. And I actually gave my book out to the whole class. And they seem to be excited to have it. I've never done so many signings, <laughs> but in any event, um, but one of the professors, I, I asked her to do this and she said, she flipped it over. She said, oh my God, that's totally applicable right now. I'm having a problem with this right now. So that's the kind of um, 
that's how I like people to use it. And I, I, you know, I've also seen people who have my book and they do, they dog ear it, they've underlined it, they've highlighted it, they've written in the margins. Like yeah. to me, that is the best compliment ever when people can actually use it as, you know, like a user's manual, you know, to, to help you just think about something different. Listen, there's lots of things out there like that, right? Um, there, you can get cards, you can get angel cards, yeah. you can get all kinds of things you can pick and go, okay, here's a thought for today. And if it's an inspirational thought, is it going to help you? Sure. Why wouldn't it? No, absolutely. <laughs> inspirational thoughts never going to hurt, right? So, so let's, the one inspirational thought that you really, and you talked about this at the beginning, Sharon, the self-discovery and self-awareness. And especially for lawyers, I find that many don't try to go on that self-awareness uh, journey. It feels um, something we shouldn't do. We're very logical. We should know what we need and, and move forward. But you're really, really, really in that first part of starting the journey encouraging all of us all of your readers to embark on that journey of self-discovery um and there are first steps that you need to living that truly intended life let's start with what you mean by one of the themes that you raise well two of the themes you raise idea the name of the book and your one thing those two concepts really form the foundation for for the journey that you took and that you're inviting your reader to take tell us about idea and one thing all right, so idea is meant to be um, sort of the totality of of your journey, right? The things that, being on a journey that's going to make you happy. And in order to do that, you have to do a couple of things. And one is to figure out what your one thing is. So your one thing, as I was saying, is how you come to the world. Like, what is your first um, you thought when you're trying to help people. And as I've said, um, or not even help people, like what do you do when you're in a group or, or what is, what's, how does your mind think? And for me, it is to want to help people. Um, I've described some other kinds of one things in there. Um, and I have, um, I have a friend who's also a lawyer who she likes to connect the dots and so when she goes into a room, I mean, you know, I guess you can call this, um, you could call it uh, networking, but, but she truly, like it truly lights her up. Okay. So she goes into a room, she's looking at who are you? What do you do? Like, what do you have to share? What can I share with you? Who can I connect you with? Like, she's a real connector of, of people. And I call it dots. You're a dot collector. And when I told her that she was delighted, she knew she did it, but she didn't know what it was or why. And she was so, um, it, it informed now how and what she does because now she understands why she's doing it and what she's doing why it gives her joy right um and so ultimately i say in order to figure out your one thing sometimes you don't know it yourself she didn't know it she knew she did it she didn't know it was her one thing until i reflected that back to her so trying to figure out your one thing i think you need to ask people around you as to you know what you do how you do it um you know they can, if you get the same kind of feedback from your friends, from your colleagues as to how you approach a problem or a business situation or a social situation or those kinds of things, I think you'll start to be able to put together, you know, what your one thing is. I have another friend who, no matter what happens in her life, she immediately looks for the bright side in it. Like that's just her go-to. If something bad happens, she goes, okay, then I've got what I've got. I'm going to make lemonade out of lemons. That's just what she, she makes the lemonade all the time. Um, and it's just like, how do you come to things, you know? And so that's your one thing. Um, in order to get to idea, you need to figure out that those two lists, right? So the one list is what you're good at and what you really enjoy doing. And the other list is what you're not good at. And be brutally, brutally honest. I mean, if you can't be honest with yourself about this, who can you be honest with, right? There's no downside. You're beating yourself up all the time anyway. Sabotage. We'll get to that. Mm -hmm. So why not be really honest about what you're good at and you're not good at? But you need to be equally honest about what you're good at. And I think we're, we find that harder, in fact. Mm -hmm. So 
I think that you should just take the list of things that you're not good at and go, fine, I'm not going to work on those. I mean, within reason, right? Like, you can't just say, well, I'm not good at filing my taxes, so I'm never going to file them or anything like that, right? Like, you're going to say, okay, I'm not good at it. I'm going to find someone else who's good at it, and I'm going to make that happen some other way, right? So either you delegate or either you get marginally good, you know, to an acceptable level if you have to. But why not work on all your really good qualities and what you're good at and make those fabulous that's how people excel right they take what they're good at and they work on it and then they make it better and better and better and better and better and they know what it is and they know they can make it better doesn't mean they don't need practice doesn't mean it doesn't need some work but you know that if you like it and you're good at it then you're going to be able to be great at it so if you take that and your one thing and now you marry those things together now your idea is really forming, right? Your idea is the direction you're going to go in to make yourself happy. Well, I'll tell you, if you're doing things that you're good at and that you like and that are consistent with who you truly are as a human being, you can't help but be happy. I mean, you're not going to be happy all the time. Don't get me wrong. I mean, no one's happy all the time. That would just be boring. <laughs> yeah, you, you know, you, you can be um, more happy than not. Like, I actually love being a lawyer because I have tried to minimize the things I don't like about it. I don't take clients. I, I had someone ask me the other day, my accountant, say, what kind of clients can I send you? I said, look, I, you know, I don't need complex um, estate drafting because I'm an estates lawyer. I don't need um, complex, you know, it's got to be people, multi-billion dollar businesses or whatever. I don't need the most complex like litigation or anything. No, thank you. I want the clients who um, appreciate my services um, and who are, you know, well, pay their bills. That's always a good one for a lawyer. Um, pay their bills, appreciate the services, and they're genuinely nice people you want to help. And that is that is really, for me, right, what makes me happy as a lawyer because I love connecting with those people. I don't care if they have a simple garden variety will. I don't care if it's totally complicated. I don't care about those things. Do I like an intellectual challenge? Yeah, I'm a lawyer. You know, we all, we all we're not in it because we want easy, right? No one becomes a lawyer because they think it's easy. Um, you do it because of a number of things. And one of them is that intellectual challenge. I get that. But, you know, ultimately, I think it's whatever you do and how it makes you feel that is important. And if you're feeling good more often than not, then I think, you know, then you, you've kind of hit where you should be on those kinds of things. And I, I was just looking at who's litigation in-house with some litigation background. I mean, you know, every environment is very different too. So it's not, so whatever you do and whatever you bring to the table, you have to be able to use that well within whatever environment you're in. And your environment is not just practice area, what you're doing. That's a big part of it. I mean, I would rather, you know, stick needles in my eyes and do purchases and sales on a real estate transaction. Like, I just know, I just don't want to. I mean, I do transfers for like, you know, planning and trusts, but I, I don't want to do that. Um, there are others great. who do love it. So there we go. Right. Absolutely. And, and they would fall asleep doing a state law. Let me tell you, like a lot of people would not want that. Like I fully get that. Um, and, you know, ultimately, um, we all find, you know, what we like. It's, it's on your list, right? It's on the left side, the things that you like and you're good at. But it's also the people you're around. I, I, I can't stress that enough. How many lawyers work for a firm? Okay, you work for a large Bay Street law firm and you're paired with a partner that you just don't get and they don't get you and it's stressful. And then you go, that's it. I can't be a litigator at a large Bay Street law firm. Not true, right? It's not true. So we tend to write ourselves off when we get into an environment in which we do not belong. And it's not, we don't belong because of us necessarily. It's because of that. I mean, it takes a village. It's because of them. It's because of you. It's because it's no one's fault. It's just, it's not where you should be. But when you find the right place to be, then I think, you know, ultimately, that's where it all starts to come together. So you've got to allow yourself to be somewhere that gives you that sense of satisfaction. Yeah, the, the place that we're at really does matter. And, and you know, I'm thinking back, 
back in practice, I actually really liked the place that I was at. That was not the challenge or the issue. It was the, what I was doing that was not resonating with me. And until I finally made that, I kept thinking I had to go to another organization. That wasn't the case. It was changing what I was doing, not where I was doing it at or the, with who. But I really love, you ask, and I think this comes up in your book, um, there's a couple of pages of, you call them basic mental exercises to get you started thinking about your one thing. And I love the position of strength or the thing strength-based decisions of of what we're good at but you ask a lot of really good questions and then you take it deeper um to 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 ask some more questions it's about and i this is where i've written all over the place um some of the questions early on when you think of the concept of all things you your eunice if you will what's the first thing that comes up what demotivates you that's one of the questions that that i have in a in a values exercise that I do, what gives you the crazies? What what demotivates you? What qualities about yourself would you say are most self-defining? These are some of the things that you asked. I love the, are you a leader or a follower? And there's no right or wrong, good or bad. It's just be honest, really, really honest with yourself. And then the go deeper, um, how did it make you feel? This is about sort of um, um, experiences. How did it make you feel and why? Who was there? And think about the entirety of a situation. What is about you that is uniquely you? That's one of the questions that I ask my clients all the time. Uh, and then you, I'm going to say uh, one more thing, and then I'll ask you about these questions and how you sort of arrived at them. Examples of things that are in the bad column, how to come up with that good and bad column. And I love the first one. It really gave me perspective hitting the snooze button about five times every day you call you said that was about yourself right i still I thought, do that <laughs> i hit the snooze button maybe three to five times yeah actually sometimes even five times a day i love how you're being honest and how you very vulnerable and sharing your sort of bad column uh with people acting on impulse thank you for adding letting the laundry pile up <laughs> Um, but again, it's being brutally honest. Um, how about these two areas, the the questions that, tell me a little bit about how you came up with those questions and what they meant for you. I mean, again, I think it was partly trying to figure out where I needed to go in my own career because it became patently obvious that um I liked being a lawyer, but there was a lot about it I didn't like. And so I had to examine these kinds of things in order to figure out what it was um, about being a lawyer that I liked and what it was about me, right, that made me good or bad at certain lawyerly type activities or expectations. Um, expectations, I always say, are the leading cause of disappointment. And worst of all for yourself, because we can never meet our own expectations. I think, you know, that is the, the single most difficult part um, about being a lawyer, because, you know, you start out and you, you're cold. You start in a general population. OK, you're pretty smart. You kind of got, you know, you're surrounded by people. Some are smarter, some are not as smart or whatever. And you get to university and then, you know, people sort of drop away and then you get to law school. And now you're surrounded by a lot of smart people. And so you start to change your concept or your perception of yourself based on those around you instead of based on you and I think that is the difficult part about it right so our expectations of ourselves are way more than we would ever expect of a friend you know one one thing that you know I think you have to think about is that if you're having a problem that you can't get past because your perfectionism is not allowing you to see the answer if a friend came to you and said, what should I do in this situation? You would have great advice for them. And I bet you'd be surprised at what that advice would be. And you'd be horrified to try to take it yourself because you would never take it yourself. You would give it to a friend. And so I think that's the most, you know, it's those kinds of things that I was trying to get at. I was trying to sort of step outside a little. Okay, let's try to be a little more objective. Like, what is it you need and what do you not need and those kinds of things to try to get you know through the exercises so we've gone through the exercises we're about to start the journey but you you raised something that many of us don't like thinking about or may not experience uh sorry not experience but not acknowledge you call it sabotage uh in in my coaching world we call it saboteurs i want to hear you define and explain 
what you mean by sabotage and why you thought it was important to include it and how we manage it. Well, you know, it's it's the last piece of that first, you know, section of the book. And it's because that's how we all start. We all start with the self-sabotage. The voices in our head. (laughs) Yeah. And it is it's just um, it's brutal and it's brutal in a way that we would not tolerate from anybody else. The things we tell ourselves, if someone else said them to us, there is no way we would tolerate it. Mm -hmm. Right. You just wouldn't. You would fight back. You'd say that's not true. But we say them to ourselves all the time. And I mean, I'm sure you've heard this analogy before. I guess vampires are an analogy for anything that's like life draining and soul sucking <laughs> and whatever. But, you know, I'm. it's true. Like the beginning of that chapter says, sulky, sultry, sexy sabotage slinks along, emitting some kind of secret mating call that's seductive at a basic level. Who are you to resist? Sabotage lures you into the den of inequity with every smoky look. And you know sabotage is bad for you but it doesn't help so why are you so darn attracted in the first place you can't help it that's why but ultimately um as i say a page later you have three choices when sabotage enters and if you're going to keep telling yourself that you're not good enough or that you know you're never gonna make it even when you do make it you're not going to get any joy in it because in the back of your head you're still going to be feeling that imposter syndrome. That's a big thing too, right? It's like, if you keep telling yourself these things, that you don't deserve to be where you are, that you're not good enough and all of those things, there's three choices. So you, you know, and I, I liken it to a vampire because really sabotage can only come in if you invite it in, mm-hmm. right? Yeah. Vampires don't get past the door unless you say, come on in. And they have to stay outside. So we all say, come on in. <laughs> and at that point, you have three choices. You become its servant and go mad like Renfield and Dracula. You're consumed, drained and lifeless. Or you become a vampire yourself and suck the blood of others. And that's exactly how it happens with sabotage. Remember I said that conflict and, you know, incivility, it's all all caused by that lack of of, um, of security, by lack of confidence, by by the things that basically, um, you know, you're you're letting in in order to cause these kinds of conflicts because you're being overly, you know, you, you doth protest too much as it were when you get to conflict. But sabotage I think is the most important thing to recognize and the most important thing to try to get rid of as early as you can. It's not easy. It's not easy. And one of the things that I do with my clients, cause I, I had it done with me, um, with my wonderful coach, um, we give our saboteur um, a job to do, get rid of it, right? Um, sit on that mantle, you know, go protect the dirt, acknowledge it. And I think that's one of the things you have sort of a 12 day process of dealing with and managing our uh, managing sabotage, acknowledging it and recognizing it and the harm that it's doing to you is one of the first steps and Absolutely. then managing it, right? That's absolutely right. If you don't recognize it, I don't think you would be able to combat it. Like, if, okay. if you, you know, if you, I, I think you have to be honest with yourself about it. Mm-hmm. And I say, yeah, it's like, it's, um, I, what do I put? 11, it's, was it 11 steps? And because any habit they say can be broken in 21 days. So I say, do these 11 things, do them the second time, and then you're out. There you go. <laughs> right? Two 20, uh, 20, day 22. Um, it's not that simple. I'm, you know, I think that ultimately you have to keep at those steps because you know counteracting if you so one thing I tried doing that again not not everything is going to be successful you might have to keep trying these things till they stick or till they work right so sometimes when I have a negative thought I'd, I'll go okay I'm recognizing the negative thought first thing and I go no I'm not going to have that sorry I, I'm, I'm not going to entertain that right now and I just stop it it's like you I actually have that conversation with yourself yeah I stop recognize it's like stop drop and roll yeah. <laughs> if you have your own fire just yeah. stop drop and roll I like and that. that's kind of what I do with it um sometimes it works sometimes it doesn't for a period of time it was very effective but it, you know the more you practice it the better you know you're going to be at those things too um but you know recognizing it as first and then try to counteract it you know with some other thoughts you know think about three things you did today um that you know made you happy or three three things you did well or right like those kinds of things things that could have gone worse um those kinds of things to try to counteract the negative thoughts 
everyone's heard this over and over again. Your thoughts really do form your reality, right? Um, and so, you know, was it was it Ford who said? I've got it in the book. See, I forget what I've written already. Um, so I think whether you think you can or you think you can't, you're right in either instance. I think it was Gerald Ford. So ultimately, that is true. Your thoughts form your experiences. Make Absolutely. no mistake. If you're thinking in terms of lack, in terms of not good enough, in terms of not worthy enough, in if you're thinking in those terms, perfectionism, if you're thinking in terms of those things, then you're going to get it. You're just going to get it because you're going to make it happen for yourself. Uh, you um, you talk about in, in part two a number of things, uh, clues to discovering your idea, examining your feelings, I'm not worthy, um, uh, getting stuck, climbing upward. Those are all important for us to, to deal with. But in the interest of time, I really want to get to the roadblocks because I think especially we'll come back to the the uh, the navigating. But I want to make sure we spend time on roadblocks. You have a list of them mistakes, confidence, fear, anxiety, jealousy, guilt, sadness and loss, and energies around us. I said that intentionally slowly because lawyers, law students um, tend to be immersed in them, usually silently. They're things that we won't necessarily talk to our friends about all the time. So, so much of this reality resonated with me when I was going through that part of the book, part three in particular. Many of these, as we said, impact lawyers and law students and other professionals. Can you talk about what you think has the greatest impact on lawyers and on lawyers' mental health and wellness of all of these that you mentioned? Which ones um, resonate with you and, and have the greatest impact? You know, the thing about lawyers and, and mental health, you know, like I said, lawyers are people too, right? So um, you can't separate the person from the lawyer. You definitely can't. Um, and, you know, all these, I would say all these things. I, I attended the um, the mental health summit for the Law Society. There were in excess of 4,000 people, I think, who had signed up for that. And there was a completely alarming statistic to me that I had no idea of. And it was that 24% of legal professionals have suicidal ideation at some point in their career. I mean, that's just not right. Like it should never be that way. And a lot of these things will contribute to that. I mean, anxiety, right? Anxiety left, left unchecked turns into um, disorders. Right. So either that's where you get, you know, whether it be obsessive compulsive, it could be it could be eating disorders. That was one thing that was discussed on the, at the mental health summit that we don't even recognize so much. Right. So there's, uh, what we do is internalize the anxiety and it and it comes out. You can only stick your finger in the dam for so long and, and something's going to give somewhere else. And it's with mental health because it, ha it has to be. So ultimately, you know, it's amazing to me that lawyers can be super high functioning, experience these things, and nobody ever knows it, um, you know, ever. And and that is the, like, um, Orlando De Silva, for example, his platform when he was uh, OBA president was mental health and how, what a, a crippling, um, you know, depression disorder that he has. And it would be, it's cyclical. Right. So ultimately, you know, there are times when you can cope better, times when you can't. And nobody ever knew. Mm -hmm. Nobody ever knew. And he says, even in, in the mental health summit, still battling with it every day. Like so many of us are battling with things every day and nobody knows it. Nobody understands, you know, it. no one's willing because everyone's afraid. You asked me in the beginning, is it Sharon Drodge? Is it Sharon Davis? Is it Sharon D. Davis? Like, what is it? And the fact is, um, when I first wrote this book, I thought this would be complete. I was fearful. So I had fear, number yep. whatever, five. <laughs> and um, so I had fear that that would not be accepted. This book would not be accepted by like an analytical legal community that was really neat, pretty straight laced. You can't talk about anything alternative. Like it's just all got to be. So I thought, OK, I'll keep I'll keep my um, I'll say my author life and my um, professional life separate, which is why I did Drudge. Um, and ultimately, you know, now I'm going back to Sharon Drudge Davis, because we all have identity crisis through our lives. And yeah. I've had a couple. So the first one was I got married. So my maiden name is Drudge. So that's what's on the book. And I got married just, uh, well, probably a month after I finished my exams in law school for the third year. 
And then I got called to the bar and I used Sharon Drodge Davis because, I mean, you know, you don't know if the marriage is going to work out or not. I mean, 35 years we've been married now. I figure it's probably going to work out. So I've dropped like the Drodge and I used Sharon D. Davis for my um, for my professional name. But now, because the book is under Drodge, and I realized, really, for me, you know, I'm a combo of all of it. I'm moving a little further back to Sharon Drodge Davis. Um, but but ultimately, I was just as fearful as anybody else about doing what lawyers say lawyers are supposed to do. So yeah. that is why that happened. And, you know, if you don't get a handle on some of these things, like I say, you know, like fear, dread is like like the Sunday scaries and stuff that comes a little bit before fear. Um, fear can like, you know, escalate into um, anxiety. Worry can be like a constant thing that's just going to eat away at you all together. Um, and, you know, ultimately, while we're on it, um, too, I know you wanted to maybe save perfectionism for more okay. toward the end, but we might be about there. Um, you know, perfectionism was also something that was discussed in um, the Mental Health Summit. And it is, to me, as I was hearing the stories and as I think about perfection, to me, it's akin to a cancer. I think perfectionism is something that eats away at all of the organs and other supporting structures in your life. If you let perfectionism go too far, um, I think that it's going to destroy instead of enhance. And I'm sure you've heard that perfection, per, perfect is the enemy of good. And it's, it's very true um, because it's not even someone else. It's object like it's not an objective thing. Perfectionism. There's no definition of what is perfect, right? It's it's your internal sense of what's good enough. And let me tell you, if you think you're not good enough, then nothing you do is going to be good enough ever, yeah. ever. You know, you're never going to get it. I have to say, you were talking about mental health, and I, I, um, if I looked like I was looking at my phone, it was because I needed to find the the book. For those of you who may not be aware, for those who are aware, um, I recently got the book and was trying to read it at the same time and I thought it's two different it's similar but very different the right not to remain silent I don't know if anybody has heard about it but it's the truth about mental health and the legal profession uh, by Lexis Nexus uh, and it's the really I, I did read Orlando's story Orlando is one who's uh, contributed to this um, this book Beth Beatty some really fabulous lawyers across and I don't know if it's in Ontario or across Canada who have been very vulnerable to disclose very publicly the mental health challenges that they've had while also maintaining um, very active, successful, quote unquote, however you define successful careers. And I think being able to have the conversation is really important, but the roadblocks are there. The fact that you add jealousy, the fact that you add sadness and loss. We had um, Taya Mikado on a couple of uh, months ago talking about grief and how it impacts our, our performance. Um, the guilt, I love that you included guilt. These are real roadblocks that can impact our our, forget about our, our profession, but our day-to-day -day activity and our day-to-day -day living. So I, I really was appreciative that you included um, roadblocks within within the chapter or within the, the book. Um, and then you also, because you talk about the roadblocks, but you give some travel tips, and I love these. There's a course out in, in at Western uh, Law right now that is uh, taught by one of the contributors of this book, and I'm going to get his name. I, I forget his name off uh, off the top of my head but he's actually teaching a course on meditation uh, to Western law students. I'm teaching uh, emotional and cultural intelligence and a lot of what we do, uh, it's a five day intensive, but we talk about um, what I would consider would be your travel tips, helping you to navigate some of the roadblocks on the journey to being, you know, the idea, living the idea of you. In terms of the travel tips, I wonder, Lawyers oftentimes don't think that they're relevant or even available to them sometimes. I had a, a lawyer today who was in her sixth year of practice and she she broke down um, over something that was really troubling her. And I said, you know, are you, are you receiving therapy for now? She says, I actually don't know how to get that. And we had to talk that through. So some of the resources that might be available to you that you don't realize, you offer tips such as thinking about purpose, gratitude, there's science behind gratitude, enjoyment, thank you for letting us have joy, um, happiness, balance, and change. 
Are there any of these that you think are more relevant for lawyers and how do we implement them to support our professional lives, Sharon? I think ultimately, again, it starts with the recognition and not all of us want to go to somebody else and ask for help. I mean, so this is why it's so important to at least attempt to help yourself. Right. So if you're not at the stage where you want to go to someone else, recognizing these feelings and doing simple things like even just mindfulness. Like if you if you fill a sink, you've got the plug in the sink and the water's running. If you never let the plug out ever it's going to overflow. I mean, you know, that's just physics and we all know it. And it's the same thing, I think, with ourselves. That's the thing about having fun. Surely you can take a moment or a day or something and go, okay, I'm going to have fun for this moment and live in the moment. It's very difficult to do. You have to quiet your mind. Um, meditation. I mean, I'm not saying you have to meditate and have, you know, out of body experiences. I'm saying that you should sit quietly somewhere with maybe some music with no words. That's just calming your mind. You know, there's actual, um, another thing I find helpful sometimes, I don't know if anyone's heard of the Sophagio scale, like music therapy or, um, frequencies. Look at, look it up. Sophagio scale. Um, and, um, you, there's music where I actually put, I've taken to putting it on. I used to put like mellow jazz on when I'm like, if I'm drafting or doing something like that. Now I use the Sophagio scale. It, it might have like nature sounds or it might just be, you know, mild background music, but it's got frequencies in it that helps to calm your mind. You can get apps that tell you bedtime stories that will uh, have those Sophagio like frequencies, things that binaural beats that help your brain try to assimilate with one another there are lots of things you can do without going out and finding yourself a therapist or writing a book and bearing your soul about all your you know perceived inadequacies mm -hmm. so many things you can do right so there's you know find something anything that works for you and you may have to try a few different things but my advice I think is again about how you think about things so work-life balance so I mean first of all having fun is really super important to me Mm -hmm. Um, I'm a bit of a, I, I have to say I'm, I'm a little bit addicted to fun. Like if I don't have enough fun in my life, I find I get a little antsy. It's like, I have to find something fun, go to a concert, you know, have dinner with friends, go to a, go to the movies, like whatever it is, like have some fun, first of all, but second of all, work-life balance, people tend to think I've, I've seen so many things in work-life balance. Here's how you have work-life balance. You start at nine and you end at five and you stop your emails at five and then you don't think about it until, you know, and I, no, just no, no one can do that. Not sustainable, not going to happen. To me, work-life balance is having control over your own life and your own work. So if I want to be off in the afternoon, I'm off in the afternoon. If I want to work on a Sunday, I'm working on a Sunday. If I want to answer emails at 2 a.m. On a, on a Sunday morning, I'm going to answer emails at 2 a.m. on a Sunday morning. Um, it is all about setting expectations of yourself and of your clients. Um, you know, even though I do answer emails at all hours of the day, no one expects me to. And I've set those expectations. If I'm going away, I frequently go away for a month at a time. And I'll start two months before I go away. And I'll put an out of office, like on the bottom, please be warned that I'll be away the month of August. If you need anything, you better get me before August. You know, I'll tell every client I've got. I'll tell every other counsel I've got to the point where I'll go away in August. And I'll come back and I think, hmm, I probably don't have a practice anymore because I'll get no emails. And then they all flood in the minute I'm back because I've trained people, right, that I'm away in August. If you need me and it's an emergency, you can get me. I'm not, you know, I'm not going into outer space. I'm going to Europe or whatever. But Ultimately, I think if you can set your own and your client's expectations around, um, you know, your work life balance. Now, granted, it's harder to do that as a younger lawyer when you're working for other people. Um, but, you know, there are environments in which you can do that. And especially now with the work from home, you know, balance, sometimes they'll let you work from home a couple days a week and, and work, you know, in the office a couple days a week. Um, but I think there's always an answer. And if your environment doesn't lend itself to what works for you, then again, maybe you're, you are, you like nine to five and stopping at five. And if that's for you, then 
awesome. Like do that. Right. It's not for me, but if it's for, you know, whatever you feel is the right mix for you to be able to manage things and to feel comfortable with, you know, what portion of your life is spent on work, when and how, and what portion of your life is spent, you know, on the other important things in your life. I mean, I don't think anyone's ever wished on their deathbed that they'd worked more. No. You know, and they I... Sorry, Regret the things you do, not the things you don't do, right? Yeah, no, absolutely. The uh, work-life balance, I've stopped saying. It's more work-life integration sometimes, figuring out what works for you um, uh, well. Now, uh, Jocelyn put something in the chat, and I know you said the word, Sharon, so I want to, again, I'm learning new words that I didn't know. Binaural? I'm not sure how is binaural, it. Binaural, yeah. Binaural. Okay, thank you. So I, I'll, I'll look that up as well um, to, to, to hear what you mean. Those are the frequencies, Beats. I think that's what we were talking about, Jocelyn. Good. Um, before I ask you the last question, I wonder if anybody else has any comments or questions of Sharon. Um, I do have a couple of more questions to go, but I just wanted to open up for comments or questions before we move on. Oh, I wouldn't mind asking, asking a question. question. Um, Welcome. Hello, uh, Jocelyn. <laughs> hi. Good to see you. Um, it's been a very interesting uh, discussion, but I have to admit, and I know Gina knows this, like, I have not read the book because I only found out about this, I think, like, earlier today. Uh, but here I am. Um, in terms of the meditation that you've done, are you, have, have you, do you do any guided meditations, or is it just sit in silence and soak that in? <laughs> I've done both, but I think guided meditations are most helpful. I would I would always recommend a guided meditation um, because it gives you something to think about. It gives you a voice to follow, and it's easier to keep your mind on that than it is to just sit there in 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 solitude. Um, you know, I have done some med always with music, always with something. I mean, you know, sometimes meditation can be something as simple as pondering an issue or a problem and waiting in the silence for an answer to come to you, right? Um, it can be like that, but uh, I highly recommend, I use the, um, the Breathe app um on my phone um and i i find that's very helpful like i said it's got a bunch of different things it's got just music with the beat in it the beats in it it's got guided meditations it's got bedtime stories like it's got a lot of it, like not everything's for everyone right and you find your favorite voices and your favorite guided meditations and what you want to meditate on and what you don't want to meditate on but the times in my life that i have been most anxious to the point of, I don't know how I'm going to handle this anxiety. I always turn to that and it always helps me. You know, it's, I, I appreciate the question, Jocelyn. For me, I, I have yet to be able to cultivate a really effective meditation practice. Uh, for me, it's running. That is my meditation. When I run that, that sound, all I hear is sort of my running shoes on either the treadmill or outside or wherever I might be. And that constant sound, and usually with some music is where I tend to get into the, lost in that groove. Um, but everybody finds their own, their own thing to do. There's a woman, Heidi Brown, Heidi K. Brown. She uses uh, her middle initial as well. And if you haven't um, heard from her, she was one of our authors last year, I think, uh, earlier this year, rather. And she talks about the different dimensions of lawyers. And one of them is the artistic and physical. She sort of brings those together. But it's what you were saying as well, having having fun she talks about having art dates you know taking yourself to a museum or taking yourself to a paint you know to a um a place where an art gallery or taking yourself to something where your creativity would would be able to come out and be able mm -hmm. to be um honed would would really be useful in terms of being able to give you that clarity that you need for creative problem solving and similarly the physical impact of whether it, whatever exercise, whether you love dancing, whether you love just walking, whether you love a, a good game of golf, whether you like a, to me, good game, a good game of golf doesn't go together, but I know I think you like <laughs> it, so I'll, I'll get that. Um, but being able to cultivate those additional supports that we need, that can really, really help us both to um, um, gain some some calmness, uh, reduce some of that anxiety, but also get some clarity sometimes and cultivate some 
pathways that open up for that creative thinking that we might think, whether it's about a file, whether it's about work, whether it's about what we're doing as well. You were, if I'm not mistaken, out in nature when you sort of had that, the thinking of, of a lot of these, um, these elements in your book. So meditation doesn't have to be a formal meditation practice that works for so many people. And I, I welcome that, but there's other ways that we can achieve the results if we need to, I think. Uh, I'd love to hear your input on that. Absolutely. I think whenever you can get to a place where you can quiet your mind, yeah. that that is meditative, right? So whether it's hearing, you know, your, your sneakers on the treadmill or, you know, whether it's walking in nature and hearing the birds or whatever it is, a time when you're not thinking about all the other things. And, you know, this sounds trite, but it's true. Um, living in the moment, because I think it's the best thing that you, you can do for yourself, because it does you no good, let's say, to be at work and be worried about your family because you should be doing something for them and then be at home with your family, and be worried about work like you're giving everybody nothing. <laughs> um, of you and I don't think that that really works and I had said to you Gina before we started as well uh, I don't know I don't think I've said it um, in this uh, context once we came on but you know only when you love yourself more than anything in the world can you love other people the way they deserve to be loved because if not you're always thinking that you're not you're not worthy you're not you know you're not enough for them other you, you just can't you got to stop and you got to love yourself and I think the only thing the only way you can do that is to live in the moment I think right I've even said to my assistants <laughs> so I can't take a cold call from someone I'm not going to remember who they are and it's not because I have a terrible memory it's because I've chosen not to keep all my clients and all my files in my head all the time because I was finding I couldn't sleep. I couldn't do anything. I was anxiety ridden. So I made a conscious choice to not remember. And so when I get my notes, if someone's going to call me and I've got a client call coming up, I want my notes. I'll remember everything about them. I can converse with them in a way that they deserve to be conversed with. Not for me to have a whole bunch of things in my head at once and take a cold call and I don't know what I'm talking about. Yeah. Like live in the moment, do the best you can do in the moment. If I'm with a client, like they've got my 100% attention, I'm not thinking about any other clients. And I, I try to do that in my life in general. If I'm having fun and I'm with my family, I'm not thinking about the you know clients or what I have to do. I can't do it anymore. You're caring about your clients, you're caring about your family, and you're also caring about yourself. And I really like the fact that you, in your book, you talk about, you know, here's something that lawyers don't often think about, love along the way. And you talk about different kinds of love, family, friendship, love and expectations, the nature of love, sex and love, romantic love, misfit love. I love that element of it, the misfit love that you included. Um, enabling bad behavior. That was really, I, I was so glad to see that part in it. And then it came to self-love. And as you said, um, your opening uh, in that area of, of self-love is love is the magic elixir, the one secret ingredient in every human life. It's essential. Without it, we all wither and die. And again, what a visual that that placed for me. Lawyers and law students, somewhere along the way, I don't know where in that journey that most of us have been on, we lose that ability for self-love and for self-compassion. And you've you've really honed in on the fact that it's something that we need to be able to develop, right? Um, meditation, enjoying uh, ourselves. What else do we need to develop this really much needed quality uh, for, for us to be able to go out in the world as we really need to go out? I think we need to have a lot more compassion for ourselves. I think that most people have zero compassion for themselves and all the compassion in the world for others. Um, and we we don't ever allow ourselves that same sort of self-compassion. Um, if you make a mistake, then, you know, you learn from it. When you make a mistake, you, you learn more than if you did it right. I know if I make a mistake, I will remember it forever and I won't make that mistake twice, right? If I do something right, I go, what was it I did? I don't remember what I did. <laughs> so that is is how, you know, these things work. Like, uh, you know, a mistake is just a precursor to success in any event, right? Like, you know, it took a thousand tries for um, Edison to make the light bulb. So, you know, it's uh, it's one of those things that you just have to you have to keep at it. It's hard to do in the face of I think we're so willing to accept criticism of ourselves 
that we just kind of take it and run with it. Yeah. You know, and then it becomes a story we tell ourselves. And I think you got to let go of that story. Again, I'm not telling you that all these things are easy to do. They're not easy to do. And being a human being means that it's built into our DNA. We're not we're not that, you know, um, unalike like uh, human beings, no matter where they are, what they do, um, where they were raised, what culture they have, we all have the, this, this one thing is, is what we do in, in, in common is that we do all, um, you know, have insecurities and beat ourselves up and lack of compassion and work on self-love. I mean, you know, maybe the Dalai Lama, <laughs> I don't know who else, maybe, maybe Trump, <laughs> I don't know, <laughs> seems to love himself a lot. But otherwise, you know, most of us struggle with it. And, you know, I'm not saying, I mean, no one's going to be perfect and no one's going to be perfect forever. And you're going to have ups and you're going to have downs. And, you know, what happens, again, it, it's pretty trite, but also true that it's not the destination, it's the journey. And when you get to your destination, what do you do? You think up where the next destination is going to be. You don't just stay there, right? You don't just stay there. It's it's all about the journey. Um, and, you know, love, people tend to overestimate and underestimate the power of love. I think that love comes in so many different forms. I do believe self-love is the most important and the most difficult. But friendship um love from strangers you you can you can encounter a stranger and have like a random act of kindness right mm -hmm. um you can have best friends who give you a very different sense of love than love from a you know that that romantic passionate love that everyone dreams about mm -hmm. um you know that's a different different matter as well all these pieces of love form and a, a piece of your life and and they make up who you are and they all make life worth living because ultimately none of us live in a vacuum and you know we live to serve uh, whether you want to or you don't want to that's our purpose i i, I really appreciate that that formed a, a chapter a part of of your book um because the impact of having or not having all those different types of love on our professional careers is so important we seem to think that we can separate it right there you know that's one area that I don't have to worry about how it'll come into our world but really it does impact our professional career as well uh, when we have or don't have um, love in our lives in the different ways that you said I want to end before we we go to the conclusion with just one reminder you and I've had this conversation you opened up with it and I just want to sort of again reiterate perfectionism. Uh, lawyers, especially some female lawyers, most of us female lawyers, have a tendency to want to, to strive for perfectionism. And it's that balancing that we need to do between giving it our best, right? Striving for the best. You're not saying don't go for the best, but that internal need to be perfect and trying to keep that at bay. Any final thoughts on perfectionism before we close? Yeah, I think the most important thing is, is it, you know, strive for what you, no one sets out to do a mediocre job, um, you know, strive, strive, mediocrity, it's where I'm going. <laughs> um, but, you know, if you don't succeed, it's not just try, try again, cut yourself some slack, right? Just, just pick yourself up, dust yourself off. I mean, wallow in it for a little while, if you have to, you know, let yourself feel bad, but then pick yourself up and move on with it because ultimately, you know, the spot, do you know what the, the spotlight um, uh, is? Syndrome. Is it a syndrome? Something like that. Spotlight theory where um, everyone thinks that everyone's looking at them. Mm. But in, in the meantime, you may fall down, you may, you know, have failed or whatever, and you think everyone's looking at you. They're not. They're yeah. looking at thinking everyone's looking at them. <laughs> and they haven't noticed <laughs> because everyone suffers under that spotlight theory, right? You all, everyone thinks that everyone's looking at them and they're not. And so everything blows over, like everything, the things that make you feel the worst in the moment and you think you're never going to recuperate suicidal ideation, just wait for it. As long as you can just wait for it. And, you know, Orlando De Silva said this too, like there's a point where you just go, 
you just have to wait because I mean, you know, you're going to get to the point where, um, you know, there's there, you're going to see a solution or things are going to change because that's one given in life. Nothing stays the same. I remember a, a quote by um, Tom Hanks and he was asked, you know, what would you have liked to have known earlier in your career that you know now? And he said, you know, when you're, you know, first starting out and and you're not getting the roles and you're feeling really down and like you're a big failure. He said, you know, just remember that this too shall pass. But he said, you know, later on when you're doing really well and you get all the accolades and the Oscars and people think you're doing great. This too shall pass <laughs> because that is exactly what life is like. It will always change. And as I said, there is no problem um, to which there is no solution. You may not see it, but you just have to wait for it. And it's hard to do. But if you find a way in the interim, you know, um, and just get to the next stage, um, things do resolve themselves. So perfectionism to me just absolutely not a good thing and um we we tend to look at it as a good thing i think we tend to hold it up on a pedestal as oh you know um it used to be what was it in articling and say well what's your worst quality oh i'm a perfectionist and that used to be like the coy you know response but ultimately it is definitely not a good thing and it can lead to really serious um issues i think if you let it go too far agreed no agreed um i i definitely don't encourage people to use the phrase or, you know, the think, Oh, I'm a perfectionist I, as a, as part of the answers in, in job interviews. Um, let me just make sure before we close that there's no other comments or questions. Um, and I want to be able to, I've put up your information. You're on LinkedIn. You've got um, the idea book, idea, the book.com is uh, where they can reach you. Your email address is here as well. Uh, yeah. Sharon, Sorry, one thing I didn't give you was my Instagram. I mean, the real me is on Instagram. I started during COVID. It used to just be sort of inspirational things and about the book. And then it kind of morphed into more personal life. But it's idea underscore the underscore book on Instagram. And we've only got a few people on here. If you, my email address is there. Or if you want to contact Gina, I'm happy to send you my book. I've got lots of copies. I I pretty much I give I'm on Amazon, but I give them away. Uh, I just want I just want people to have some sort of use of them, even if you use it for stickamancy. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. I love it. Sharon, um, just a reminder that it's an hour and a half for anybody watching it later or now an hour and a half professionalism credit for uh, for this conversation. A huge thank you. Uh, one of the quotes that I found uh, in your book near the end really sort of puts it to all of us as, as a sort of nice concluding remark. You say at page 215, you can get out of life whatever you want based on what you put into it. So have passion for your life, live it as if you like it. Thank you for helping us to like our lives today, to live um, in, on a journey that is really helpful. And I really am grateful for uh, for the participation that you have today. And just as a reminder, before we close with uh, Sharon, with any last words by Sharon, next month we are speaking with Colby Sharma um, with his new book. And I say it's new. It's probably a, about a year old, The Curveball, a story of grit, adversity, and winning at the game of life. And he give, uses a really great uh, baseball analogy. I promised him that I did not like like baseball, but I still actually enjoyed the book when, when I had read it when it first came out. Sharon, any final comments to, uh, from you first? No, I would just say get out there and enjoy the journey. But uh, yeah, have fun. I appreciate it. Thank you to everybody. Have a really great rest of the day. And we're really grateful to everybody. Bye-bye now. Thanks. Thank you.